Currently, the Chinese government is vigorously constructing a mega canal project. The total investment for this project is 72.7 billion RMB, or 10.2 billion US dollars, with excavation volume about 340 million cubic meters. Amid a weak economy, rising unemployment rates, and a sharp decline in exports, China is experiencing a rapid withdrawal of international capital. Manufacturing giants such as Foxconn, Samsung, and technology giants like Amazon are leaving China in succession. The decoupling between China and the developed economies is accelerating, gradually eroding China's status as the world's factory. The Chinese Communist Party has proposed a so-called internal circulation and dual circulation, with one crucial method being to expand domestic demand. General Secretary Xi Jinping at the Economic Work Conference last year linked expanding domestic demand with investing in major construction projects. This has become a unified narrative amongst Chinese media and officials. In this context, the Chinese government is investing substantial funds into the construction of water projects in an attempt to stimulate economic growth. The mega project highlighted in this video is the Pinglu Canal, located in the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. Was construction officially commencing on August 28, 2022? As of now, the Pinglu Canal project has completed over 11.7 billion RMB in project investment, with plans to reach an investment of 18 billion RMB by 2023, accomplishing an excavation total of more than 100 million cubic meters. China's official reports describe the Pinglu Canal as a landmark project of the new era. A major project for becoming a strong transportation country, and a leading project for the new land sea passway in the West Region. The Pinglu Canal starts from the Pingtang River estuary in the Xijin Reservoir in Nanning, Guangxi Province, extending to the southwest along the Qinjiang River. Then it reaches Qinzhou Port, where the canal flows into the Gulf of Tonkin in the northwest part of the South China Sea. The total span of the canal is 135 kilometers. According to media reports, the navigation level of the Pinglu Canal is classified as Inland Class One, which can accommodate 5,000 ton vessels. The canal is designed to have a one-way throughput capacity of 89 million tons per year. The project includes waterway excavation, shipping hubs construction, cross-river facilities along the canal, and supporting projects. It aims to develop shipping primarily. Combined with water supply, irrigation, flood prevention, and improvement of the aquatic environment, the project is estimated to cost 72.7 billion RMB in total, with a construction period of 54 months. Official media have stated that once completed, the Pinglu Canal will not only support the development of Guangxi, but will also become the shortest, most economical, and most convenient maritime passage for the southwestern region of China. This route shortens the voyage by approximately 560 kilometers compared to the previous route from Guangzhou Port along the Pearl River. Due to the construction of the Pinglu Canal, the reduction in transportation costs brought about by the diversion of cargo volume from existing channels can exceed 5.2 billion RMB annually. The Pinglu Canal, starting from the water surface of Xijin Reservoir and ending at sea level, has a drop of approximately 65 meters. Over the 135-kilometer canal, the construction of three main hubs, Ma Dao, Qi Shi, and Yu, is needed to segment the channel into three steps, allowing ships to traverse the waterway to the sea exit through navigation locks. Each of these three hubs includes the construction of navigation locks, dams, and hydropower stations. On June 30th, 2022, the Guangxi Autonomous Region established the Pinglu Canal Group Co Ltd. Was a registered capital of 20 billion RMB. The company is responsible for the investment and construction of the Pinglu Canal project, along with the daily maintenance, operation, and comprehensive development of the economic belt along the canal. On July 20th of the same year, the Guangxi Development and Reform Commission approved the feasibility study report of the Pinglu Canal project. Construction officially began on August 28th. Several experts on Chinese affairs have stated that the construction of the Pinglu Canal is largely motivated by the CCP's aim to sustain economic growth. Even though it may reduce shipping time and distance by providing another sea exit, it will not necessarily increase the total trade volume. Instead, it adds a considerable debt, making the losses outweigh the gains. 
According to the 2022 Statistical Bulletin of National Economic and Social Development of the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, the total volume of goods transported in Guangxi for the entire year was 2.1 billion tons. The three major ports of Qinzhou, Beihai, and Fangcheng, along with other smaller ports, handled a total cargo throughput of 568 million tons, of which 169 million tons were foreign trade goods. Guangxi's import volume is a little bit larger than its export volume. The Pinglu Canal's designed annual throughput capacity is 89 million tons, which is estimated to far exceed the actual demand. In Guangxi, where the economy is not very developed and the volume of exported goods is not large, the necessity and potential economic benefits of spending 72.7 billion RMB to carve out the Pinglu Canal to replace the existing Pearl River Sea exit are subjects of intense scrutiny among experts. One expert on Chinese affairs, Heng He, stated that while canals have the advantage of low water transportation costs and large load capacity, they often connect water systems at different elevations, requiring ships to pass through navigation locks, which adds time and cost. There are many other transportation methods, and shipping is not always the most effective or economical, especially if the investment is too high. It is simply not worth it. If it's completely government-funded, the cost ultimately falls on taxpayers. If it's raised by collecting funds, investors might not recoup their costs, Heng He said. Davy Jun Huang, a Chinese economist based in the U.S., indicated that about 30% to 35% of China's GDP growth comes from infrastructure investment. Infrastructure is divided into two major sectors, private real estate construction and large-scale infrastructure projects, the latter of which accounts for about 15% of the total GDP. Recently, due to the containment of the pandemic, the Sino-U.S. trade war, tensions between China and Europe, and the recession of consumer markets in Europe and America, the growth of the Chinese economy has been sluggish. As a result, China has increased its infrastructure investment to stimulate economic growth. However, the problem is that most highways, high-speed railways, and airports are almost completely built beyond actual needs. The CCP has now targeted water transportation, preparing to stimulate the economy through investments in this sector. In addition to the Pinglu Canal currently under construction, the Xianggui Canal is also being actively promoted. As shown on the website of the Chinese Ministry of Water Resources, in 2022, the number and scale of major water projects in China reached an all-time high. National water construction investment in 2022 amounted to 1.1 trillion RMB, a 44% increase from 2021 making it the year with the highest completion of water construction investment. Huang believes that this approach has an immediate short-term effect to stimulate the economy. However, in terms of medium to long-term economic development, it is not considered particularly useful. China's infrastructure has been fully improved over the past two decades. The entire road network, railway network, and high-speed rail has been accomplished in advance and canal projects can only provide a short-term stimulus. China's official media claimed that the Pinglu Canal has opened a convenient sea exit for southwestern China, but there are already three railway lines connecting to the Gulf of Tonkin port in western regions like Chongqing, Chengdu, and Guangxi, in addition to the existing Yangtze and Pearl River sea exits. Huang believes that the main consideration is to redistribute some of the import and export business originally allocated to Zhuhai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and some ports in Fujian to the Gulf of Tonkin. It's essentially just a redistribution of the economic pie under the condition that the total economy remains the same. Wang Weilo, a water expert based in Germany, said, China's water investment has been 1 trillion each year for the past two years. Without this amount, China's economic growth rate of 4-5% to would simply not be achievable. However, investing just to maintain economic growth percentages is meaningless. It's better not to invest in projects that do not yield economic benefits. The Chinese Communist Party's strategic document, the Comprehensive Plan for the New Western Land-Sea Corridor, also pointed out another purpose for building the Pinglu Canal is to strengthen economic and trade cooperation within the ASEAN countries. Officials in Guangxi stated that in the future, Nanding Port will become a transshipment port. 
Goods from the southwest will be assembled in Nanning and transported to Qinzhou Port via the Pinglu Canal for shipment overseas, shortening the time and distance by nearly 70 percent compared to shipping from Guangdong. ASEAN member countries and China have signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, a free trade agreement that went into effect in January of 2022. From 2019 to 2022, bilateral trade is expected to increase by 52 percent, surpassing the 20 percent increase with the EU. Critics argue that it will be difficult for Guangxi to break through in trade with ASEAN countries because trade essentially involves mutual exchange. Guangxi appears to have a high degree of overlap with Southeast Asia in most of the products it can independently produce. Aside from fruits and a small amount of machinery and processing with supplied materials, thus it lacks significant advantages. David Huang believes that the southwest regions were never big exporting provinces to begin with. Their industrial and agricultural products are fairly similar to those of Southeast Asian countries, with the more likely scenario being that they import raw materials such as iron and nickel ore from Southeast Asia. The authorities have always wanted to make Nanning, Guangxi, a so-called ASEAN trading center, but the main demand from ASEAN is for China's small household appliances and industrial products, while China needs their agricultural products, industrial raw materials and minerals. Huang said, "Currently, through Shenzhen and Guangzhou, this demand can essentially be met." Recently released data from China's General Administration of Customs show a year-on-year -year decrease in exports by 7.5 percent and imports by 4.5 percent in May of this year, when measured in U.S. dollars. China's share of trade with the U.S. continues to decline. From April last year to April this year, China accounted for 15.4 percent of U.S. goods imports, the lowest share since October 2006. In U.S. dollar terms, China's exports to ASEAN fell 15.9 percent year-on-year in May, the first decline since May of 2020. Shipping at mainland China ports has significantly slowed down, with empty containers piling up. In Shenzhen's Futian Street, idle containers have even been converted into volunteer service stations. After three years of pandemic impacts, a suppressed real estate industry, and the U.S.-China trade war. The debt of the Chinese local government has become increasingly enormous. Wang Weiluo commented, "The key issue is that the Pinglu Canal will not yield economic benefits. Is it meaningful to make exports from Guangxi a little faster? Guangxi originally had export channels through Guangzhou and Shenzhen. Those ports are not filled to capacity, nor are they unavailable for use. They are now idle." Why not release the feasibility study report for this project and let everyone see what it really is, right? The Gulf of Tonkin is a little closer to Vietnam, Cambodia, and Malaysia in terms of transportation distance than Shenzhen and Zhuhai. Does this distance play a decisive role? Can the 72 billion in costs truly be compensated for? This is hard to estimate, but it would indeed save some expenses for products exported from Vietnam to China. However, it doesn't mean that saving some costs will lead to a large amount of trade between the two countries. It's not that significant," said Huang. According to public data from the Guangxi Finance Department, in 2022, the GDP of the Guangxi Autonomous Region was 2.6 trillion RMB, with an annual general public budget income of 168.8 billion RMB. The budget expenditure was 589.4 billion, resulting in a deficit of 420.6 billion RMB. Guangxi has been facing a huge fiscal deficit for many years. The construction of the canal project, costing 72.7 billion RMB, represents a massive expenditure for Guangxi. However, the question of having money or not is one thing; how to spend it on construction projects is another. Let's look at two examples to illustrate the style of Guangxi's leaders in implementing projects. Guangxi officials are undoubtedly enthusiastic about constructing mega projects. The Datengxia Water Control Project, located in Guiping City, started construction in 2015 and is about to be completed this year. The total cost will exceed 28 billion RMB, and it boasts the world's largest ship lock gate. It's reported that the area of the ship lock is equivalent to two and a half football fields. 
The gate of the ship lock is 47.25 meters high and 20.2 meters wide, with a cost of 100 million RMB. This is, so far, the largest ship lock gate globally and has been dubbed the world's first gate. Regardless of its necessity and benefits, it has certainly made a name for itself. The most illustrative example of Guangxi leaders' aesthetic sensibilities and investment style is the Guangxi New Media Center project, completed in October 2018. The project covered 15.2 acres and had a total construction area of 256,000 square meters, costing 2 billion RMB to build. The officials claimed that the building integrated elements of Guangxi's natural landscapes, such as Guilin's mountains and rivers and Longji rice terraces, into the architectural design. It's a symbolic structure strongly imbued with Guangxi's cultural characteristics and serves as a representative image of Guangxi. However, in December 2019, this project was rated as one of the top 10 ugliest buildings in China for its crude imitation and coarse image. Regarding the decision-making style of CCP leaders at all levels towards engineering projects, we have conducted a detailed analysis in previous videos. Once officials decide to build a project, intellectual elites then prove the project's necessity and its economic and technical feasibility. In reality, these so-called project feasibility studies are not genuinely researching the project's feasibility. Instead, they are providing technical support for the leader's decisions. According to official data, by 2035, the freight volume of the Pinglu Canal will reach 95.5 million tons, and by 2050, the freight volume will reach 120 million tons. In an ideal scenario considering induced volume, the volume will reach 150 to 180 million tons by 2050. The transportation cost savings in 2035 and 2050 are projected to be 3.6 billion and 5.2 billion RMB respectively. How are these figures calculated? On what basis? Even considering all modes of transportation, Guangxi's total annual freight volume is a mere 2.1 billion tons. All the mega projects that China has built in recent years have undergone feasibility studies and the conclusions were technically and economically feasible. However, the actual results differed significantly from what was anticipated in the feasibility studies. For instance, the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, which cost 19.7 billion US dollars, has actual vehicular and passenger traffic less than a third of the projected figures in the feasibility study, leading the public to dub it the Ghost Bridge. The collected toll revenue doesn't even cover its operating costs. The 77 billion US dollar South North water transfer project has an actual average annual water transfer volume on its eastern route that doesn't even reach 10% of its design capacity. The central route transfers around 60% of its design capacity annually. The profit from selling water doesn't even reach 2.5% of the investment, insufficient to cover loan interests. At Xiong'an Railway Station was a total construction area of 475.2 thousand square meters and a total layout of 13 platforms and 23 tracks, videos uploaded by netizens showed weeds overgrowing the station plaza, devoid of people. All these mega-projects are vanity projects built by leaders to showcase their achievements. The feasibility study reports for these mega-projects have all been reviewed and approved by expert panels and government departments. Speaking of the Mega Canal Project, one cannot help but mention the Sui Dynasty in Chinese history. The fall of this dynasty is largely connected to the construction of the Beijing-Hangzhou Grand Canal under Emperor Yang of Sui, also known as Yang Guang. Furthermore, the conditions of the Sui Dynasty bear many similarities to contemporary China. The Sui Dynasty was established in March 581 and overthrown in May 618, lasting only 37 years. The famous scholar Wang Fuzhi of the late Ming Dynasty stated, The wealth of the Sui Dynasty outstripped even the prosperous periods of the Han and Tang Dynasties. Historian Ma Duanlin of the Song Dynasty also recorded in Wenxian Tongkao that, 
the wealthiest country ever since ancient times was the Sui Dynasty. Historians have summarized three main reasons for the downfall of the Sui Dynasty. 1. Excessive Superinfrastructure Construction The Sui Dynasty built the Beijing-Hangzhou Grand Canal, which was almost 1800 kilometers long, and connected the Hai, Yellow, Huai, Yangtze, and Qiantang rivers. This project conscripted as many as a million civilian laborers. In 607 AD, Emperor Yang ordered the construction of a road from Yulin in Shanxi to Beijing, which was 1500 kilometers long, in preparation for an attack on Goguryeo, the ancient Korean kingdom. Records show that the Sui dynasty built its eastern capital, Luoyang City, with a monthly labor force for the construction sustained at 2 million people, during which a large number of workers died. 2. Constant military mobilization and launching of wars Emperor Yang launched three military expeditions against Goguryeo. Each of the first two expeditions involved millions of troops, and behind this massive force was the civilian labor required for transporting supplies and the materials consumed. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers lost their lives in Goguryeo. 3. Ostentation and external largesse In 610 AD, when foreign envoys and merchants from the western regions came to Luoyang, Emperor Yang, in an attempt to display the magnanimity of the Sui dynasty, set up grand theaters on the streets outside of Duanmen Gate, beginning on the 15th day of the first lunar month. There were as many as 18,000 musicians, and their music could be heard tens of miles away. The entire venue was brightly lit, and performances continued until the end of the month. When Emperor Yang toured the grasslands to check if the Turks were truly submissive, the entourage accompanying him included not only officials, but also 100,000 horses and 500,000 troops. When Yang Guang arrived at the big tent of Qimen Khan, he set up Sui ceremonial guards and flags inside the tent, hosted a banquet for Qimen Khan and 3,500 key tribal leaders of the Turks and bestowed on everyone tens of thousands of pieces of silk and satin. These were all at an enormous cost. 4. Extravagance and Waste Emperor Yang of Sui made three trips to the southern regions, each time accompanied by an entourage of at least 100,000 and at most 500,000 people. His vessel was a grand dragon boat, 200 feet long, with four decks, exhibiting extreme luxury accompanying concubines, princes, ministers, monks, nuns, Taoist priests, and imperial doctors traveled in thousands of opulent large ships that stretched for over 100 kilometers. Just the laborers pulling these ships numbered more than 80,000. As the supreme ruler, Emperor Yang embarked on massive infrastructure projects, waged relentless wars, and indulged in extravagant pleasures which ultimately led to the downfall of the Sui dynasty. Now, look at the spending model of today's Chinese Communist Party. Constructing mega vanity projects, spending heavily on aircraft carriers, warships, launching space stations, and generously giving money to other countries. Yet, many ordinary people struggle to meet basic living needs, unable to afford meals or basic medical care. The high cost of housing means many cannot afford homes with some resorting to living in concrete pipes or on the streets. Unemployment rates remain high. Citizens have no freedom of speech. Anyone uttering words displeasing to the CCP can easily be disappeared. The wealth gap in China is vast, with the red aristocracy monopolizing a considerable share of societal wealth. Ordinary citizens find their paths to rise to the upper echelons blocked, while the privileged class does as it pleases. If a leader of a large country, obsessed with constructing mega-vanity projects to showcase his achievements, disregards the hardship of his own people, lavishly gives money to other countries, and constantly seeks to point the direction for the world, aspiring to become a once-in-an-era emperor, isn't that ludicrous? Of course, there is a viewpoint that the current leader of the CCP is, in this way, squandering the party's foundation. If the CCP loses its financial capabilities, its downfall won't be far away. However, the painful experience that ordinary people at the bottom of society would have to endure is a distressing concern.